Jesus said if we would be quiet, rocks would cry out. And if somebody today knows God's been too good for you to be quiet now. If you can't praise God in church, I don't know where you feel comfortable giving him glory. If you can't say amen in the sanctuary, you in bad shape. If you don't know how to praise God down here, don't die and try to get into heaven. Because that's all they do up there. They sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Tell somebody, tell them you better practice down here. I don't want you to get to heaven and not know what you're doing. Amen. This morning, as we seek to hear a word from the Lord, I want to invite you to a very familiar passage of Scripture that will prayerfully speak and teach in a very unfamiliar manner. It's located in the heart of the Old Testament in the 17th chapter of the first book of Samuel. If you're able to navigate in your Bible and your app to 1 Samuel chapter 17, you'll find a very familiar story there that really is recorded in the entirety of the 17th chapter, but for the purpose of preaching, I want to begin our journey in verse number 32. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse number 32, we ask those who are able, if they would stand with us as together we reverence the reading of God's holy word from 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse number 32. If you're there, say amen. amen. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Today, as we reflect on that familiar passage, I want to talk to you about before the battle begins. You may be seated in the presence of God. Before the battle begins. Let me just confess and get this out the way. It's been a rough week for me. It's been a rough week. For those who are not on the inside, my Cowboys took it on the chin Monday night at home to the Redskins. I had to live with that. And not only did my Cowboys lose, but my hometown team, the Chicago Bears, took a loss to the Miami Dolphins. The Bears were predicted to win the NFC North. With the abundance of talent that they have on the team, they have underperformed, to say the least. And the loss to the sad Miami Dolphins <laughs> was just icing on the cake. They interviewed one of the star receivers for the Chicago Bears, Brandon Marshall, and asked him how is it that the Bears, who are obviously more talented and predicted to win the NFC North, how they could lose to the sad and sorrowful Miami Dolphins. And this is what Brandon Marshall said. He said, we lost in the locker room. He looked at the loss and the defeat and said it wasn't because the Miami Dolphins were better than us, it wasn't because they were better coached, it wasn't because they had a better game plan, it wasn't because of who had home field advantage, it wasn't because of who Vegas predicted was the odds on favorite. He said the reason we lost is that we lost in the locker room before the game began. Speaking about the discord and the disunity that's affected the Chicago Bears, Brandon Marshall suggested 
that before we put our uniforms on, before we stepped on the field, before we saw the opponents, before the coin was tossed and the ball was kicked, we had already lost because we lost before the game began. As a matter of fact, would you touch somebody real quick and just let them know you can lose in the locker room? <laughs> my brother, my sisters, that's not just in the game of football. That's in the game of life. That you can be defeated before the battle even begins. Can I tell you early on in this sermon, how you come out of a battle is typically determined by how you choose to go in it. Your success in a struggle is dependent upon what you do before the struggle begins. Your deliverance from a storm can be determined by how you go into the storm. The outcome of the interview is set before you even get to the interview. The result of the test can be determined before the first question is even asked. That what you bring to the battlefield will determine what happens on the battlefield and how you look coming out of the battlefield. Go and rewind, press play, Pastor. What you bring to the battlefield will determine what happens on the battlefield, which will ultimately decide how you look coming off the battlefield. Which is a simple way to say that how you begin and how you go in will determine how you come out. Let me give you an exegetical example from one of the most familiar stories of Scripture, David's battle with Goliath. You've been to Sunday school, you've been to church about three, four times, you know how this story goes. The dreaded and hated enemies of young Israel, the Philistines, have gathered once again to war against the armies of Israel led by King Saul. They have arrayed themselves on opposite sides of the Valley of Elah. The Philistines on one, the Israelites on the other. And rather than engaging in traditional common warfare which would result in the magnitude and the multitude of the loss of life, the Philistines have sent into the valley their warrior, their champion from a city of Gath named Goliath. Bible says he stands six cubits in a span Scholars argue as to how tall he really is, but this is what we can say about Goliath. He's big and he's battle-tested. He's tall and he's got the testimony of terror. Thousands have fallen at the sword of Goliath. And the Bible says this Goliath comes down to the Valley of Elah at the same time every day looks up at the armies of Israel and challenges them to send one man who can stand against me. He looks at the children of the living God and says, send me one man who can fight against me. And if he beats me, the Philistines will be your servants. But if I beat him, Israel will serve us. Give me one man. And sad to say, not one soldier from the camp of Israel takes up the challenge. Nobody wants to mess with Goliath. Nobody accepts his challenge. Nobody wants to get in the valley and battle against a man who stands six cubits and a span. That is until a teenage boy by the name of David shows up. Now, if you've been to Sunday school, you already know how the rest of the story plays out. David goes down in the valley, takes a rock and a slingshot, throws a rock, hits Goliath in the head. Goliath falls down dead, and David is the great champion of Israel. Scholars who read this story wonder, how in the world could one rock kill Goliath? How can one pebble that fits in the slingshot take down a man who has killed thousands with the sword. And I suggest to you that the reason scholars are baffled is because they fail to understand that David had more in his arsenal than five rocks and a slingshot. That hear me, y'all, it, it, it's not 
the rocks he found in the valley that won the victory. But it was some stuff he took to the valley that caused him to win against Goliath. Don't you miss this. It wasn't what he found when the battle began. But it was the spirit and the attitude and the mindset that was within him that brought him victory before he even set foot on the battlefield. It's not what you have in your hand. It's what you have in your heart that determines what this battle is going to look like. Somebody, you need to know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not, but they are not physical. They are spiritual. You've got to have the right attitude. You've got to have the right heart. You've got to have the right spirit. And if you go down into this battle that you're about to face, if you go into the next challenge of life that's awaiting you, if you face the next sickness, the next struggle, and the next storm with the right stuff in your spirit, you can take down some giants. The Bible says, if you read through this whole 17th chapter, 1 Samuel, that when David gets down to the valley, notice that he has four conversations with four different groups of people. When he gets down to the valley, if you start in verse 17, chapter 17, you'll find in verse 26, he speaks to the soldiers. In verse 29, he speaks to Eliab, his older brother. In verse 32, he begins to speak to Saul. And in verse 45, he begins to talk to Goliath. Y'all stay with me. It's Bible study. In verse 26, he speaks to the soldiers. Verse 29, he speaks to Eliab. Verse 32, he begins to speak to Saul. And verse 45, he speaks to Goliath. And in those four conversations, we uncover four weapons that David had concealed on him that he brought down to the battle that ultimately won him the battle against a giant he had to face. And I would suggest to you that before you go into the next struggle of your life, that you equip and arm yourself with some spiritual weaponry that will bring you victory in any struggle, any circumstance, any battle, any challenge, any sickness, any storm. If you will arm yourself today with four things that David brought down into the valley, you will find victory every time. Can I drop them on you and let you go to Sunday school? Four things from four conversations that David had in his spirit that allowed him to win victory over Goliath. Number one, watch that when he shows up in the valley, the soldiers who've gathered around, Deacon Johnson, they're all talking about how big and how bad Goliath is. How many soldiers he's killed and how tall he is and how powerful his weapons look. They're all talking about Goliath and they're afraid of fighting him. The Bible says that while David is down there, Goliath comes out at the same time of day and makes the same challenge. He says, send me a man to fight with me. And all the soldiers start talking about how bad Goliath is. And David says, what shall be given to the man who kills him? <laughs> David shows up. Goliath makes a challenge. All the Israelites are afraid. And David says, what y'all going to give me when I kill him? Okay, okay one, one more time. David is there. Goliath makes a challenge. All the armies of Israel are afraid, and David says, what do I get when I win? What distinguished David from all the other men of Israel is that David had a vision of victory for his life that the others around him did not share. When others forecasted failure, when others predicted defeat, when others saw an obstacle that could not be overcome, David looked at the same thing and saw himself victorious on the other side of the battle. David didn't wonder about the battle. He wondered what would be the reward when I come out on the other side of the battle because I already see victory. I already claim victory. I already believe it's going to work in my favor. The battle ain't the problem. Problem. I want to know what the reward is. That in order to fight the challenges of life, you've got to have 
a vision of victory. In order to have a vision of victory, the first thing you've got to remember that David understood is that Goliath and this battle is not something I'm going to. It's something I'm going through. You do know there's a difference between a mindset that you're going to something and a mindset that says I'm going through something. When you think you're going to it, you say that's your final destination, that that's the end of the road, that that's the last chapter. But when in your mind, no matter what the battle is, you tell yourself it's just something I'm going through, then you already begin to see yourself on the other side of whatever it is you're about to challenge in life. And I don't know who I came to preach to, but I came to encourage you early on Sunday. You will get through this. You will make it through this. This won't last forever because we serve a God who specializes in carrying us through some things. We don't walk to the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't walk to the fire. We walk through the fire. We walk through hard times. We work through tough situations. We live through rough seasons in our life. But if you trust in God, wish I was in a Baptist church, that we serve a God who will bring you out of whatever you find yourself in. He brought Moses out of the Red Sea, brought the children of Israel out of the wilderness, brought Daniel out of the lion's den, brought the three Hebrew boys out of the fire, brought Gilligan. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. No. You, you ain't seen coming to America. Touching them, tell them you need to get out more. You need to get out more. Let me give you more scripture. He brought Peter out of prison. He brought Paul out of the storm. He brought Lazarus out of the grave. He brought Jesus out of death. And there's somebody here today that's a witness. He brought me out too. And the same God who brought me out then will bring me out again. Would you do me a favor? Would you channel your Diana Ross and nudge your neighbor and tell him I'm coming out. <laughs> this is something I'm about to go through, but on the other side, I see myself wiser. On the other side, I already see myself better. On the other side, I see myself happier. You've got to have a vision of victory before the battle begins. See yourself with a job before you take the interview. See yourself successful before you start the business. See yourself healed before you go through the surgery. See yourself cancer free before the first round of chemotherapy and radiation. See yourself happy before you break up with him or her. See yourself independent before you kick them to the curb. See yourself going out before you even start to walk in it. That, 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 that's the problem. You all know in my beloved Southside Chicago that there's a multitude of violence and gun violence and killing of young black lives. And they're doing an expose on the History Channel about the violence on the south side of Chicago. And they're talking about these young black men and they were interviewing some gangsters and they, the dude who was interviewing them asked them, what do you plan on doing when you get to be about 60 or 70 if you're living like this? And watch what he said. We don't plan on living that long. <laughs> that the reason they're so violent now is that they have no vision for their lives at 70. They don't see themselves at 65. They see themselves dying young. 
But I just come by to tell you that if you're going to make it, you got to see yourself. Can, 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 I, can I testify? I see myself at 95. At 95, I'm going to be fit and trim and still getting it in. At 95. At 95, all of my bills are paid. At 95, my hair may be gray, but every one of them is still going to be on the top of my head. At 95, I'm still going to be playing golf and breaking 80 on the front nine. At 95. I'm still going to be driving, and I don't care if you blow at me or not. I'm going to go as slow as I feel like going. At 95, I'm going to say whatever's on my mind and never apologize to none of y'all. At 95, I'm not going to be pastor in the church, but I'm still going to be in church. And I'm going to kiss every young girl under 30 I can find. At 95, when I'm in church and a preacher starts to make me feel good, I'm still going to praise God. I, I, I may not lift my hands and I may not take a lap, but I'm going to get my little slow rock in because I see myself living the life God has for me even when I'm old and gray because you've got to have a vision for victory in your life. You got to see yourself victorious. So when he talks to the soldiers, David says, listen, I've got a victory of vision. But then notice after he talks to the soldiers in verse number 29, he begins to have discussion with his oldest brother, Eliab. And listen at the negativity Eliab puts in his spirit. Look at the vitriol and the discouragement and the nasty talk of his oldest brother. He says in verse 28, David, I know why you're here. You came down here to see the battle. Where have you left daddy's sheep? You're insolent in your heart. You ain't no good. You, I don't know why you're down here. You ain't doing nothing but getting in the way. You're meddling. David, something's wrong with you. He literally maligns David's intentions. He mocks David's efforts. He ridicules David's plan. He belittles David's vision. He disrespects David's assignment. Because whenever God has given you a vision, the devil sends someone to discourage you. That vision and discouragement go hand in hand. That there's always someone who wants to tell you what you can't do. Always someone who wants to tell you that your motivation isn't right, that your plan will not succeed, that you are not where you ought to be. You're not doing what you should be doing. The devil, and he always uses folk close to you. Notice, therefore, that when Eliab begins to speak this negativity to David, notice that this is the shortest conversation David has. He doesn't try to persuade Eliab. He doesn't try to explain himself to Eliab. He doesn't try to defend his vision to Eliab. He doesn't try to convince Eliab to support him. David understands that when you're about to go into the battle, you have to be selective of who speaks to your spirit. That you can't listen to everybody. You can't take advice from everybody. You can't deal with everybody's issues. You can't be persuaded by everybody's opinions. Because there are some people who are not qualified to speak into your spirit when you're about to go into the greatest challenge of your life. There's some folk you've got to ignore, you've got to walk away from, you've got to shut your ears to because they are not there to help you. And this is his brother, Eliab. And notice, notice what David says to Eliab in verse number 29. He says to Eliab, what have I done now? Now don't miss that word now, because that word now lets you know that David knows who he's dealing with. Because if you come to me complaining 
about something in church. And my response to you is, well, what's wrong with you now? That, that's my subtle way of me letting you know that you complain too much. And you always got something negative to say, and you're always upset about something. When someone uses that word now, they're letting you know, I know you. And this is just more the same of what you do. So David looks at Eliab and says, what have I done now? Suggesting, Eliab, you always have a problem with me. And you're not qualified to speak to me when I'm going into battle. Listen, let me tell you three quick things that disqualified Eliab. Can I drop them on you? Eliab was disqualified from speaking to David, number one, because he was envious of David. Let the church say he was jealous. Because you remember back in chapter 16, when old Samuel showed up to anoint the next king of Israel, that the first brother Jesse brought out was Eliab. Samuel looked him up and down and said, no, that is not the one the Lord has chosen. And they went through everybody else, and then they pulled in David out of the field, and Samuel said, now that's the one that the Lord has chosen. And I'll suggest to you that Eliab is upset because the favor of God has not rested on him, but the favor of God has rested on David, and never underestimate how far jealous folk will go to discourage you when they know God has favored you. Go on, preach, Pastor. He's, he's envious of David. Can, can I tell you number two to disqualify him? Watch folk who are jealous. The second thing to disqualify him, he was intimidated by David. Watch, watch what he says. Eliab says to David, you've come down here to watch the battle. Problem is, ain't none of y'all fighting? <laughs> y'all sitting up here scared. And Eliab says, you come to see the battle. Uh, what battle? <laughs> so he's intimidated, watch this, because David has a vision of doing what Eliab is scared to do. And you've got to be careful because there's some people your vision intimidates them. You're trying to do what they quit trying to do years ago. you got the audacity to believe you can take it somewhere they never dreamed they could. And they will try to discourage you because they don't want your resume to outshine there. Pastor teaching today, ain't he? Look, he, he's envious of David. He's intimidated by David. And watch the third thing that disqualifies him. He's ignorant of David's assignment. He said, listen, what brings you down here? You, you came down here and you left daddy's sheep and you're down here just to watch the battle. What Eliab didn't know was that earlier in chapter 17, David's father, Jesse, told him, take the lunches I've made and take them down to your brothers and bless them because I know they're hungry. Here's the problem. You don't understand what my father told me to do. And so now you're discouraging me because you're ignorant of what daddy told me to do. And you got to be careful of folk who have no discernment of what your father father has commanded you to do because they will try to discourage you from doing what God has called you to do because they don't know what God called you to do. There are some people you can't listen to. I, I found this out on the plane with Joe yesterday. Joe, Joe and I yesterday, we had to travel up to Hartford, Mass, Hartford, Connecticut, and, and we flew back down. And on the way back down, we got on a plane. And the lady came on the plane with three kids. Two of them were well behaved. And one of them, she was hollering to her heart's content. And I, I'm sitting on the plane trying to meditate and, and work on the sermon. And, and then Joe, Joe wouldn't watch TV because he ain't got to preach today. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write a sermon. Joe's trying to watch TV and the girl it's just hollering, and Joe says, well, I'm going to put on my earphones. I said, well, let me go get my earphones. I put our earphones on, and, and the girl kept hollering throughout the entire flight. When we landed, Joe's like, how did you get work on your sermon done uh, when that girl was hollering so much? I said, well, I had on earphones. He said, yeah, I had on earphones too, but I could barely hear the TV because girl kept hollering so loud. How could you meditate on your sermon when she's hollering so loud? I said, well, you had on earbuds. But, but three years ago, uh, the Kaya ministry gave me some Bose noise-canceling headsets. 
that when you put them on and you flip the switch, they silence all the noise around you so you can focus on what God has called you to do. And I just came by to tell somebody that's exactly what you need in your spirit. Some noise canceling headsets that there's some discouragement, some nonsense, some foolishness you can't listen to. Tell somebody something, you got to be selective of who speaks to your spirit. I got to move quick. Listen, he, he, he has a vision of victory. He's selective about who speaks to his spirit. But after he speaks to the soldiers in Eliab, now he begins to speak to Saul. And notice what Saul tells David. Saul tells David, you can't fight Goliath. You're a child. He's been fighting since he was a child. Here's what Saul says, you're 17, he's been fighting longer than you've been alive. He's killed hundreds, never lost a battle, been in the valley and always came out victorious. No one has beaten Goliath and therefore you won't either. Because you see, if the enemy can't discourage you, he'll try to scare you. He will remind you of how Goliath has been victorious over others. He'll run the list of everyone who tried and failed, of everyone who was diagnosed and died, of everyone who gave it their best and came up short, of everyone who wanted to but couldn't, of folk who dreamed and never saw it come to reality. He will run the list of how Goliath has defeated others who have stood in your shoes with the same vision to try to scare you to think that the experiences of others set limitations on you. Boy, that's better than y'all shouting. Let me see you try that again. That the enemy will try to convince you that the experiences of others ultimately set limitations on you. And here's what David says. Da da David says, listen, listen, listen. When you walk with God and you've got undeniable evidence that God is in your life, you will never allow yourself to be limited by someone else's past failures. Say that again. When you've got evidence that God is in your life, you will not limit God by what others could not do when you've got evidence that God has been working in your life. You just believe that the same God who started it back then is a God who's able to keep it going right now. Watch this. Watch this. Watch how the conversation goes. Saul says, listen, nobody else is beating Goliath. What makes you think you can and the answer, the answer, watch, I'm going to get deep. So David says, because I'm anointed. Not only do I have a vision of victory, not only am I selected by who speaks in my spirit, but I'm aware of my anointing. So Saul says, boy, what makes you think you can fight Goliath? Let me give you to the Howard John West Church. David says, well, well, Saul, I need to let you know, I really shouldn't be here. Because you see, a little while ago, I was out tending my dad's sheep, and a lion came and grabbed one of them sheep. And I was stupid enough to run after the lion. And when I hit the lion, he let go of the sheep, but then he turned on me. And I grabbed him by the beard, and I struck his head off, and I went back to the flock. And I ain't learned my lesson, because the next day, a bear showed up and stole a sheep. And because I beat the lion, I decided to go after the bear. And I hit the bear. The bear let go of the sheep. But then the bear turned on me. I grabbed him by the beard. And I struck his head off. And I just figured that if God brought me through the lion, and if God brought me through the bear, then the same God that kept me with the lion and the same God that kept me from the bear 
is the same God who will keep me against Goliath. David says, listen, I know I can win this thing because I'm anointed. Now, I want to teach you something. Anointed, anointed does not mean you talk in a thousand tongues. Anointed doesn't mean you lay hands on folk and they fall out. Anointed doesn't mean you can prophesy and speak things into existence in people's life. What anointed literally means is that you have physical evidence that the Spirit of the Lord is resting on your life. You've got evidence that God's hand must be on you. You've got evidence that the Lord is working in your life. That evidence is not the Bible you carry. It's not the scriptures you quote. It's not the church you go through. But there's some people who can look back at the hell they've been in and declare the only reason I came out is because the hand of God must have been on my life and therefore I know I'm anointed. Tell somebody, tell them I'm anointed. After all the hell I've been through, I must be anointed. After all the struggles I survived, I must be anointed. After all the surgeries I've come through, I must be anointed. After all the diagnosis I dealt with, I must be anointed. And because I'm anointed, I can claim victory in this battle. C come on, let's go to Sunday school. You got to have a vision of victory. You got to be selected about who speaks to your spirit. You got to be aware of your anointing. Yeah. But watch this last thing that takes David into victory that he brings to the battle that Goliath didn't see. You've got to go in the power of prayer. Yeah. God, I feel like preaching here. You, watch what happens. David gets ready to go down in the battle. And Saul tries to put his armor on David. And David turns to Saul and says, look, look, why are you putting this on me? And here's the answer, because that's what Goliath has. And if you're going to fight Goliath, shouldn't you try to look like Goliath? David takes it off. And this is what he says. Your armor is not tested by me. I've not tried this before. This isn't what I had on when I beat the lion. This isn't what brought me out of the bear. Now, now this may work for you, but I'm not going to let the size of the battle change the strategy of success. That I'm going to do with Goliath what I did with the lion. And I'm going to do with Goliath what I did with the bear. Saul so looked back and said, listen, listen, if you don't go down there with a sword, you don't go down with a shield, you don't go down with a helmet, what are you going to go with? David's answer. I'm going to go and I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. So when he gets down in the battlefield, Goliath looks at him and begins to laugh. He laughs because David ain't got no armor. He laughs because all he sees is a rock and a slingshot. But he does not know that David has something much more powerful. He tells Goliath, you come to me with sword and spear. But I stand here in the name of the living God of Israel and I'm going to call on his name and he will deliver this is what David says, I'm going to let you go. I'm putting this battle in God's hands. You done messed up and let me pray. You should have killed me before I knelt down on my knees. You should have ended this thing before I could lift up the name of my God. But now that I put it in God's hands, the Lord will fight this battle. The Lord will handle this situation. Is there anybody here? that knows the power of putting it in God's hands. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. That, that's as good as I can preach. Uh, can I share with you the power 
of putting it in God's hands. There are scholars who examine scripture with a scientific eye. And as they do, they begin to doubt the veracity of this encounter because they wonder how could one rock kill Goliath. So they did the science, Ross, and here's what they said, that the David with a rock the size of a baseball, that with a slingshot, the fastest he could have released it would have been with a trajectory of about 90 miles per hour. They said, and if you take a projectile going 90 miles an hour and you use Newton's second law of motion and take into effect the coefficient of restitution, <laughs> that a projectile that size at 90 miles an hour would generate about 3,000 pounds of force as it was released. That is, if it was traveling the distance of a pitcher to the home plate, which is 60 feet and six inches. But since Goliath is at least twice that far, one also has to take into effect the drag of the distance of the ball, which is working against the velocity and the force. Therefore, since he's further away, what was generated at 3,000 pounds has now reduced itself arguably to at least 1,000 pounds. That is, if David was throwing it straight. The problem is Goliath is taller than David, which means the angle of projectile for which he launched it had to be at least at 45 degrees, which means that now the ball is also working against gravity, which has also reduced the force that the ball has been released. So what was 3,000 pounds of force has now been arguably reduced to about 500 pounds of force. But you must remember that there is an armor bearer who stands in front of Goliath who would have lifted up his shield to take the projectile off course and would have reduced the force to at least 50 pounds and taken it off of the direction headed towards Goliath's head. But if David could throw it, and if it did work against drag, and if it did counter the weight, if it did go against the coefficient of restitution, if it was knocked off course and still aimed at Goliath's head, Goliath is wearing a helmet. And a projectile that started with 3,000 pounds of force and ended at 50, hitting a bronze helmet, would not have been enough to kill Goliath. So how can a young boy with one rock working against gravity, working against the coefficient of restitution, working against drag, being deflected by an armor bearer, hitting a bronze helmet, how could he kill a giant? Because he put it in God's hand. There ought to be a shout right there that if you put it in God's hands, it has supernatural power. If you put it in God's hands, it'll work against every force. If you put it in God's hands, it'll always hit the target. Is there anybody here that's ever put it in the hand of God? And God will. There was a song that the old choirs in Chicago used to sing. I put it all in his hand. This and that. This, this and that. This, this, this and that. I put it all in his hands. He can handle it, that's a fact. I put it all in his hand. Tell somebody, tell him, put it in God's hands. Listen, as you stand on your feet, you're about to go into that valley of life. You're about to face some giants that have taken out others before you. You're about to go through a procedure that has left others weak and feeble. You're about to go through a season of being by yourself that's left others desperate and hopeless. You're about to launch out in a new venture that others have failed at. And here's what God says to you, before it begins, see yourself victorious.
before it begins, know that there's some people you cannot listen to. Be aware of how anointed you are. The same God who kept you through lions and bears will keep you through Goliaths. And go into it, putting it all in God's hands. And no matter what the obstacle, no matter what the forces, no matter what the distance, God is able to take your one rock in his hands and make it hit the target you need in your life.